Do you have any idea how Arlington got to be this way? No, I really don't. I don't have, uh, like I say, I'm just new here. I've been here a year. No, que de pa yo no. Proximity to DC. Because of the metro and the Pentagon, which uh, we have it right there. I don't know the history behind all the revitalization program that's happening here, but I can clearly see the benefits that it's having. 26 square miles. What kind of changes have you seen? Well, I've seen the, uh, the older homes being, being torn down and they put up new homes, a lot of townhouses. One of the things I love about Arlington is that there are these little hip urban kind of lifestyle and then you can come three or four blocks off of that to where we live and there are these lovely little communities where there are homes and families. Have you ever thought of Metro as a tool of transformation? Well, four decades ago, Arlington did. Before World War II, Arlington was a largely rural county. Today, it is something quite different. How did Arlington change? Who were the visionaries who took a risk with Metro Rail and used it to reinvent their county? How did they do that while preserving Arlington's single-family neighborhoods? How did they convince people to get out of their cars and walk, bike, or use mass transit at a time when Americans were falling in love with the automobile? The answers to these questions may help other communities who want to reduce sprawl, reduce traffic, and shrink their carbon footprint. Transformation is slow and sometimes painful. Arlington's smart growth journey started in the last century and continues today. This is the story of that journey. Smart growth is a number of strategies and tactics relating to land use and transportation. You look at the RB corridor and it's a testament uh, can be a monument for, for smart growth. The corridors are the economic engines for Arlington. The traffic is lower today than it was in the 70s. Things that people are reading around the country, um, they will look to Arlington as examples of what can be done with rapid transit. We do field trips to Roslyn, Boston. The metro system is supposed to be in the median of the interstate highway, I-66. We almost didn't have it. A lot of places have metro and uh, don't have this. God love those pioneers, those visionaries back in the 1950s and to 60s. To think 20 or 30 or 40 years out is really daunting. We were confronted with the interstate highway system. Built enough roads to accommodate the cars. Something had to be done. Ruin the whole county if we didn't do something about it. Arlington has, since the end of World War II, had a very active citizenry. People had come here to work for the government in World War II, and they came from all over, and they brought lots of different ideas. And when you think about World War II in Washington, it was a tremendous boom for the area and particularly for Arlington. Of course, people were flooding into the District of Columbia to work in the departments there, but in Arlington you have the construction of the largest office building in the world, the Pentagon. And Along with that, the movement of uh, people into temporary dormitories uh, to work in the Pentagon, as well as more permanent housing. Buckingham and Colonial Village and the others were just full of young couples, veterans of the uh, World War II who had gotten a 
themselves married and degrees and were working for the government. My husband and I moved to Arlington when we got married. Uh, we were both living in the district. Uh, housing was still very tight after World War II. And uh, all the people we knew were young couples were living in Arlington. But we were a, a different force, moving in with new ideas, probably much more liberal uh, than the stalwart power structure of what I would call Virginia at that time. So there was a political culture here, uh, small p, but a political culture that was very conducive to uh, kind of building a future and, and, uh, and planning ahead. Uh, and it was a pretty dynamic generation. We were a can-do society, you know what I mean? We had just been in World War II. We had beat the Germans and the Japanese. And gosh, we could do anything. And we did. In the 50s, Arlington, for the first time, had the downtown stores, department stores, moving out to Arlington. Clarendon was, um, was a good part of the shopping. It had pennies, it had a movie theater, uh, it had Sears. The whole Washington metropolitan region experienced rapid growth in the 1950s. Local jurisdictions began to work together to meet the challenges posed by more development and more traffic. The Metropolitan Council of Governments had been formed in the uh, mid-1950s. It was the first time that regional uh, officials got together. Discussions had occurred in terms of rapid transit. What you do have in Arlington is a fairly progressive political culture. Um, this is, of course, uh, not long after the um, efforts to integrate the schools in defiance of the state government. The schools were a major interest, but also the development of Arlington uh, became of, it, of interest because we were just uh, building apartments uh, and gas stations almost everywhere. The first place we developed was Roslyn. Roslyn, of course, goes before Metro, so the original you know, redevelopment of Roslyn taking advantage of that location was prior to there being Metro. We wanted to change this profile of Roslyn, of low buildings, lumber yards, automobile repair yards, a small railroad yard. We wanted to change this into a uh, major commercial business center. When Roslyn was being developed, uh, we didn't promote retail. In fact, the retail that's in the buildings in Old Roslyn is very interior focused. It's not addressing the street at all. In Roslyn, life was put above ground, connecting skywalks. There's very little residential in the core of Roslyn, so we don't have the life on the street that we now know is one of the most important aspects of a 24-7 kind of community. We made mistakes in the planning, there's no question. By the 1960s, Arlington's explosive post-war growth had slowed. Uh, here there was an historic town that was basically dying. Um, in the 1960s. And, and why, was all kinds of why was For that? all the reasons other inner ring suburbs did. You know, things were migrating out. Malls were a threat to the traditional Main Street retail. And I think Arlington in particular was concerned about what was going to happen to their Main Street retail. Wilson Boulevard represented that. Like Tyson, Seven Corners, Bailey's Crossroads, all these shopping malls. So people got used to going to a shopping mall. So this area here became you know, you know, second class as far as a shopping area. Arlington folks were 
you know, looking at the larger plan and, and saw the metro as a way of really revitalizing the corridor. We were also confronted with the interstate highway system. We were absolutely aware that there was a potential growth in Fairfax, Loudoun, and we knew perfectly well that all the cars had to come through Arlington to get to D.C. There wasn't anywhere else you could do it. A lot of planners were thinking that the best thing to do would be to just build roads everywhere. And these were plans that were on the books in the 1950s. They got a lot of impetus in 1956 with the Interstate Highway Act that promised 90% federal funding for these massive superhighways. And one of the proposals was just to build highways everywhere, in which case DC would have looked a lot more like Los Angeles. It was apparent at that time that we could be carved up. We'd already had some experience. We built a new junior high school. But Shirley Highway came along and just destroyed the possibility of having an effective junior high school because it cut the community, cut it off from its school population. The highway lobby were very concerned that the initial plans for rapid transit in Washington would have scaled back existing highway plans in order to pay for rapid transit. It began to uh, come to a boiling point uh, about 1961 or 62. There was a uh, congressman named William Natcher, and he occupied a tremendously powerful position as the chairman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee for the District of Columbia. Which posed a major hurdle in attempting to get a subway or a metro system. I hate to say it, but he was in the pocket of the highway builder's industry. Congressman Natcher repeatedly stopped funding for the rapid transit system. I couldn't believe it. it was the perils of Pauline. We would, uh, we would come in one day to a meeting and there would be a lot of sad faces and concerned faces and we would be taken into executive session by the general manager and he would say, Representative Natcher is upset because of X, Y, Z. And the funding is off. No federal funding for Metro. And he came very close to killing the program entirely. We almost didn't have it. I mean, there was a standoff. I mean, it was eight or nine years after the plan was approved before it started construction beyond Roswell. John F. Kennedy uh, came in with a very different idea not only about how the federal government should work, but also how the Washington region should work. And so he appointed people who thought like him, local folks who said that maybe they didn't want these massive highways going through neighborhoods. One of these people was Darwin Stolzenbach of Montgomery County. In a lot of ways, Stolzenbach was a key figure in proposing that rail transit be a centerpiece of planning in the region. The main response was neglect. Arlington was an exception. Arlington officials were among those who were most attentive to Stolzenbach's briefing and most interested in what he had to say. The, the metro, when they begin to talk metro plan, we're for it because that is the only way we're going to escape having highways. But Arlington couldn't escape highways entirely. Congressman Natcher, still powerful, linked funding for metro to the approval of Interstate Highway 66 through the heart of Arlington and the citizens of Arlington County were vehemently opposed to it. There was just tremendous opposition to turning Arlington into an easy commute for Fairfax County. People who lived out in the, in the hinterlands, no matter where, they just wanted to get through here to get to Washington. And uh, <clears throat> we, we lived here, you know. We were in the way and we weren't going to move. Natcher's offer was simple. He would release the funds for Metro if Arlington would agree to allow Interstate 66 to slice through its neighborhoods. So we had to essentially cave on 66. We played ball, gave them some, and they were happy with what we gave them and we took what we got. The county felt it had no choice it had to have Metro. 
but Arlington did not accept the planned route for the interstate through Roslyn, an area where the county hoped to launch its rebirth. They wanted to run 66 right flat down what would have been the middle of Roslyn, which would have destroyed any possibility of, of development. And we got, we, we've got to give a lot of credit to who, the man who was then the head of our uh, highway uh, division, uh, Stoneburner, Mr. Stoneburner. Stoneburner got them to shift 66, so it moved a little bit to the side and gave us between 30 and 40 acres for, for, for redevelopment. Arlington's next and most crucial battle was with Metro over where the subway should go. When they started looking at the routes, just like the Federal Highway Administration did, how can we quickly get through Arlington? It was how can we quickly and cheaply get through Arlington with transit. The original plan was to send that metro line right up the middle of I-66, isolated from people, an obstacle to getting to those stations. And that is one of the cheapest ways to build rapid transit. Uh, you already own the land. If you manage to plan the highway with a wide enough median strip, uh, you can build the highway first and build transit later. It also means that you don't have to really worry about um, going under people's property. Since you own the property, you don't have to worry about crossing major streets because the highway is already bridging those major streets or going under them. Uh, so it, it makes a lot of sense if you're trying to build cheaply. So we were caught on the horns of a dilemma of saying, well, we, you know, we sure want transit, but we sure don't want the way you've got it planned because that's not going to serve us at all. If they want to reinvigorate the Wilson Boulevard corridor, the best way to do it would not be to send rapid transit to the north along Interstate 66, but to build an underground tunnel underneath Wilson Boulevard itself, and you'd have stations pop up right where Arlington wanted people to be, at the department stores, um, at the uh, civic centers, and of course in Roslyn itself. You know, the foresight in terms of the, the alignment of the Orange Line is amazing. It is a, a, a case study of how to do things. Given the federal installations in Arlington, uh, particularly the Pentagon and National Airport, it made a lot of sense to consider those areas near the river to be one of the key destinations for any kind of rail transit system. Um, what's interesting is that Stolzenbach broadens that out and starts thinking a little more about serving corridors through Arlington rather than just those two main destinations. I think per particularly Burt Johnson saw that as a way of, of running down the metro, down the business corridor, as a way of really revitalizing the corridor. He was a professional manager, more so than an engineer, which early city managers in this country were. And I think Burt really began to lay the groundwork for the modern Arlington that we uh, live in today. That was a conscious decision to bring the metro, where it went on the RB corridor, and also the number of stops. Arlington now had to convince the Metro Board to build lots of stations where they would best serve Arlington's needs. Metro had bought into obviously Roslyn and they'd bought into the Boston each end, but they were saying we just cannot afford to have the time element involved at all these stops. And we would say, well, look at the density that you'll be passing when you bypass that stop, because this is the office space and this is the residential areas that'll be at those stations. And if you're gonna serve density, which you're supposed to do, then you've got to stop there. And it just became wearing them down with facts. Arlington got a lot of attention. The early building was gonna be here. The planning was here. Uh, and our views were um, uh, therefore uh, given great, uh, great credence. They became convinced that Arlington really meant what they said about developing Roz and Boston Carter around the metro stations. And um, once they became convinced, then 
ink went onto the paper. Arlington's vision required many metro stops close together. The county seized any opportunity to add stations. There was a station plan uh, at Georgetown. The case for serving Georgetown with a metro station is pretty compelling, and I think most people who live there today would agree with that. The Georgetown re resident feared that hooligans would be coming from Virginia, I guess, and Washington and other places and, uh, and be a problem and a nuisance in, the, in Georgetown streets. And of course the station was going to cost an enormous amount of money. So that money was floating about and uh, we grabbed it in Arlington and, uh, and uh, got it designated for the uh, station at Virginia Square. Mr. Riggs, didn't any of your colleagues on the Metro Board look at you and say, why are you Arlingtonians so greedy? I could not greedy? imagine why they let us get away with it. I honestly <laughs> couldn't. They could, have put it, they could have put it anywhere. With the route and the stations it wanted, Arlington turned its attention to winning voter approval for Metro funding. Arlington County Board was for it. The Planning Commission was for it. Now then, we had to sell that bond issue. Well, I thought, how are we going to get people excited? So we put this metro car. See, people didn't even know what they looked like. So I brought it and put it in front of old Ken's department store. So people would enter, and they have to take a flyer, and then they'd come out, you know. And it was just a steady stream of people. The cars, quiet, roomy, air-conditioned. Automatic train controls will operate cars. So then came the election. Means. I always prepare for the worst, thinking maybe it was going to go down, and it passed by 70%. The people have given the word. The word is, go. The selling of Metro as a commuter rail was relatively easy. Yeah, everyone liked the idea of getting cars off the road, especially someone else's car. Much more difficult to address the questions of what kind of development are we going to, to uh, attract around each of these stations. And in just about every jurisdiction, including Arlington, you had some protests of people saying, I like my neighborhood the way it is, I moved here because I like it the way it is, please don't change my neighborhood. The decision to put Metro's Orange Line under Arlington's declining retail corridor was costly and, for some, traumatic. Metro did have the effect of destroying a business base. I mean, things got worse before they got better. The streets were all torn up. We didn't have the service yet. The cars were still coming through. It, we just weren't, it was just in that period of time when you're having the worst of it because of the construction and you haven't seen the changes and the benefits. I think people looked at the, at the greater good of, that this type of mass transit would bring and it also offered an opportunity to do the type of planning that hadn't been done in Arlington up until that time. In other words, to make a conscious decision that growth is going here and not scattered. Metro's coming and uh, some big decisions to be made, land use decisions, and we proposed to the county board that uh, this uh, planning committee be set up, which was called the Committee on the Long Range County Improvement Program. There were people who were uh, very active in, in voicing their fears. Some people felt that the corridor needed to be redeveloped. Some people didn't feel that it needed to be redeveloped. I think that I was probably on the side of didn't really need to be de redeveloped. They weren't saying no growth. They were saying slow growth. The issue was not that we were against Metro. The issue was how much development did Metro generate? And is that beneficial? And that's a dialogue that continues. But the point is that the focus of that dialogue was never lost. We actually tried to think of all the impacts of development. You've got to have sewer systems and highway systems. We had to buy hook and ladder, uh, all new fire equipment to go to the high rises. And we saw, saw the crossover was probably 20 years. 
before you got um, tax benefits because of all the upfront costs. People doubted in those days that development would keep their taxes lower than they otherwise would have been. Our no growth, our slow growth people became uh, somewhat convinced. It was acceptable because we understood the importance of the increase in the tax base that was at least the potential increase in the tax base, which we have now learned um, has uh, been very successful. The corridors are the economic engines for Arlington. And if we did not have those economic engines and we wanted to have the mix of services and the quality of schools that we have, we would easily see a 10, 20, or 30 percent differential in the tax rate that we enjoy today. Uh, because those, all these commercial buildings that you're looking at here, they're paying a significant portion of our tax base. The other thing I think helps is when people all over Arlington start using the corridor. If they're going shopping in the corridor, if they're going to dinner in the corridor, and begin to get more familiar with the corridors, then uh, oh, suddenly it's, it's part of Arlington. It's part of their place. I can't imagine our neighborhood without Metro now. adopted a plan where around the metro station you could have higher density but we were going to try and preserve the single-family neighborhoods right and left. In order to uh, make sure that the proper development occurred in the proper place um, we arrived at the bullseye concept. What's the easy walking distance to Metro? And that, that gave us the quarter mile bullseye around each station. Once those basic bo bones were put in place, we went back and planned with the individual communities around those Metro stations to give the individual stations their own personality, their own stamp, and to address the issues of transition from the higher density to the neighborhoods. Between every metro station area, between each area, you'll see the heights go down somewhat. Mm -hmm. And from the station area to the residential neighborhood, you'll see tapering down as well. So in both directions, the highest point is likely to be right at the metro station. And then in each direction from there, you will see, generally speaking, some lowering of the heights uh, as you taper to a residential neighborhood. Oftentimes a townhouse development may be seen as a, a logical buffer between the single family homes and the higher density uses. It was definitely a response to the citizen groups and um, the coalition on optimum growth. We, had, we fought that battle. That was not an assumption back in 70. There was no assumption where those boundary lines were. There, there was no clear lines there. The planners did not have infinite wisdom. Uh, the neighborhood didn't have infinite wisdom. But kind of with the clash and the compromise that the county board approved, uh, a better thing came uh, than the planning process uh, had uh, envisioned. We discovered what was, you know, with, with a site plan approval and a strong land use plan, we had the impetus for what has become known as the Arlington Way. But at the core of the Arlington Way is really the involvement of the community in both the planning decisions that are made and in the operational decisions that are made by the county government. So there is a connection between people and the decision makers. The notion was we tried to unite public purpose and private profit. And if you can successfully do that in anything, you've got a winner. Huge numbers of community meetings. The auditoriums were filled on those issues. Even though it was a county-wide vision, the, the key questions really related to the transit corridors. They were not trying to keep Arlington in a bottle. They were trying to rather provide a means for growth, uh, what we now call smart growth. When you 
came on the board in 1996, were you using the term smart growth? I'm trying to think. I think it was within a couple of years of that that this uh, kind of somewhat wacky movement that started among some architects um, and some social critics of, of new urbanism kind of really took off. And, um, you know, I think it has come to uh, pervade almost all of the progressive thinking in, you know, in architecture and building and planning. Uh, you know, it's combined really with environmentalism. I mean, it's become a larger a larger movement really within uh, American society, uh, which is why we, so we just happen to be, you know, kind of at the nexus of all of that. Smart growth, that's just somebody, something, somebody thought that up later and we said, oh, that's what we've been doing, smart growth, <laughs> we're for that. <laughs>
can the metro corridors do more than just produce tax revenues to pay for open space and other amenities? Arlington has found that they can do much more. They can change the way people live, work, and play. In Crystal City and Roslyn, planners and residents are making the streets livelier, creating more transit options, and adding ground floor retail. The changes all come together in Clarendon. To make an area like Clarendon uh, work, you have to have a good mix. There's a shopping mall here, Market Common, there's residential, so people live here and there's office, uh, office space, they uh, can work here. We had a better ability to apply our current planning principles to that neighborhood and you can see the difference. It's a, a magnet now for retail, for restaurants and for, uh, you know, for uh, nightlife. And so I like to take our groups on this particular little walk because this, this is about a half a million square feet of infill on that block. There have been, you know, at least two to three thousand housing units added in this maybe within maybe six blocks of here. And yet here you are on a county park with absolutely no traffic. Uh, this was part of that community benefit in return for accepting Market Common. So, do you think we're still a suburb, or are we an urban community, or what are we? Oh, I, I think Arlington is its own special community. Uh, I think parts of Arlington are very urban, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, large parts are very suburban. We've actually moved quite seamlessly from a bedroom community to a well-planned and designed city uh, in a way that doesn't bring the negatives of what people sort of associate with cities. They think of cities as having crime and bad schools and all these other things. Our city has fabulous schools. Our city has great parks. Our city has a top services. Um, we have safe community. We have a very low crime rate. So we've been able to transition from a bedroom community to all the best things of a suburban area or rural area while having the character, physical build out, and transit options of a city. Arlington has learned that you don't have to have a subway system to practice smart growth. So we regularly have people come to visit us from across the world. Now often people say, well this is great, they had the investment of a subway system and so we don't have that, I guess we can't do it. Uh, but what we've been doing most recently is taking people down to Sherlington. I mean, it's quintessentially a car-oriented community uh, with a bus transfer station there and providing great transit access, but it's off the interstate. What we've done is taking a, a community that could be literally anywhere in America and created a walkable, mixed-use community where people live and work and play. They're there all hours of the day and night. It is vibrant, it is dynamic, and you can park your car, you can drive there, and you can park your car, but you can do everything on foot. And so it's that kind of model that we learned from, from our work in the Roswell Boston Quarter that we took to Sherlington and that can be taken to literally any commercial area uh, anywhere in suburban America. But how can communities reduce traffic without investing millions in a subway system? Density is your friend when it comes to traffic. So you need to make it dense enough that the parking can be put underground and the buildings can be adjacent to one another so that when you're a pedestrian, you can create a retail area and a, and a street pedestrian friendly environment create the kinds of places that have been in traditional cities, which I think in a lot of cases in America, people have forgotten how to do cities. Destination, We've seen in some, some locations the traffic is lower today than it was in the 70s. Even though I assume there's been an increase in the population from the 70s. The population is over more than doubled, and the office population is more than doubled. How is that possible? Uh, our metro ridership just in the last 10 years countywide is up over 40 percent and people are walking more. Most of Northern Virginia is totally car dependent. 
people absolutely have to have a car for most daily functions. What are the concerns about what might happen as a result of smart growth? Uh, it's more a fear of the impacts of overdevelopment. There'll be too many cars mm -hmm. on the street, or my, my small community that I've mm -hmm. come to enjoy has mm -hmm. certainly changed a lot in, you know, what will it be like for me? How mm -hmm. will my day-to-day -day life change? Mm -hmm. We've got this new development, in, intense development, uh, here in these corridors. We've, we've got frontier areas. That is the frontier between the single family home and the less developed area and the, and the more intense development. And I, I don't believe we've really resolved that. I know the tension between single family homes and even that three to four story kind of development, like where do the cars go? And, you know, how about the delivery truck, and am I going to have big trucks on my street? But I think there are enough places like this in the county that we could have a community conversation that really is taking the best of this, but respecting the single-family or, or low multifamily neighborhoods that, that we already do have, and that are part of that initial pact from the 70s of, you know, we're going to concentrate development on 11% of the land and we're going to protect the neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that flank the metro corridors sometimes feel pressured by development, but neighborhoods far from the corridors want to make sure that they fully benefit from smart growth. In South Arlington, along Columbia Pike and in the Knock neighborhood, smart growth has only recently arrived. The success that you see along the RB corridor just highlights the lack of attention paid elsewhere. All along the Columbia Pike corridor, going uh, from the west where you hit Falls Church, going all the way to the east uh, to the Pentagon, you see clear areas where smart growth has not really had a positive impact on communities. In Columbia Pike, um, we have an area that needs revitalization that uh, we know that the commercial sector needs to be re-energized and we're working to do that. We need some new development. The recent effort to develop a, a street plan that can guide the actual uh, construction of the street and provide for rapid bus transit and light rail in the future, you know, that's given a framework or a blueprint for the pike. You know, again, this is an example of where the county, through successive planning efforts, has really done what it does best, which is create a roadmap for the future that will help to ensure that the area is successful. Now, you'll have economic cycles where things will be up and things will be down, but if you have a good plan and you stick with it, I think Arlington has proven that you can get a good quality. It became uh, painfully obvious to, to not only people who lived here, but people who visited here that there was something different about communities like Nock. It was really time to change. Uh, the community got together a few years ago and underwent a planning process that took a lot of smart growth principles and, and applied them here without the transit hub and we're actually starting to see some, some progress with that. But the big concern that you would have development that would certainly improve the aesthetics of the neighborhood but at the same time just displace individuals, that was a key concern that went into the community's role in the planning process to guide the revitalization of not. So there's a big emphasis on affordable housing. Affordable development has got to be a part of any smart growth strategy. Um, there is a great need for people to have housing at all ranges of incomes. I think that's another piece that we lost was sort of this ability for people to go from rental to little home ownership to more home ownership as they progressed in Arlington. The way development has happened in Arlington with the luxury high-end stuff, uh, we have not captured the market of people who would otherwise want to be here and contribute to the vitality of communities because they just can't pay for it. One of the ironies is that Arlington has done so much right that it's a great place to live. And when you make a great place to live, people bid up the prices and it's hard to have perhaps the same kind of affordable housing that could be a goal of public policy. Arlington has worked to compensate for the loss of affordable housing by creating an affordable housing fund. Developers must either build affordable units or contribute to the fund. 
the height and density that we're able to uh, use mm -hmm. in a smart growth model has also made it possible to get lots of dollars and sometimes affordable housing units mm -hmm. as a result of that density mm -hmm. because we're going to allow you to build a building taller than you would ordinarily but in exchange for that mm -hmm. you have to make a contribution to our affordable housing fund or you know build units either on site or nearby places like here uh, where we're getting 100 and my affordable and you get 134 that are market rate for the uh, developer mm -hmm. so that they can make their, their money the investment but we gain 100 units some trade-offs uh, there's uh, this is a segment where uh, Arlington uh, had a Buckingham village mm -hmm. and you know so we lost some apartments but in exchange we were able to preserve the rest of Buckingham village now our concern is gee is anybody who isn't very wealthy going to be able to afford to live here and some of the value that we've created needs to be recaptured uh, to ensure housing affordability for people at all income levels. If you're going to preserve a diverse residential base economically, then just as in development, as a government, we have to intervene. And we've been working very hard to intervene in Arlington. If we're going to be great, we can't have just one kind of people. We've got to have all kinds of people, and we've got to be prepared to help make that happen. lots of talk in uh, the case studies and so forth about how this has been a long-term success story in Wellington. It's been over three decades now. Not many sort of success stories that are kind of you know, looked at in, in various businesses that so forth actually sustain themselves for you know, decades and centuries on end. What do you see as the challenges to Wellington keep you know, staying at the forefront of this whole movement in the coming 20, 30, 40 years? Um, I think from the staff perspective, we're always under a lot of pressure to do better. Um, that, for example, we recently were designated a silver level bicycling community by the uh, National Bike Federation. And one of the first questions I was asked at that event is, well, when are we going to be gold status? <laughs> And that's the challenge as we go forward, is what do we want different parts of Arlington to be in the future? There will continue to be reinvestment in Crystal City and Pentagon City and Roslyn, Boston and Clarendon, uh, but we also have to look to our other transportation corridors, and the one that we focused on is Columbia Pike. For subsequent generations, I think they will have to face questions with regard to the Lee Highway corridor, and some generation will need to look at the Arlington Boulevard corridor. And all of those become opportunities working with the community to, to step back and say, all right, what is it today? Where is it going? And where do we want it to go? So we near the end of our story, but Arlington's smart growth journey continues. The county remains a planning work in progress but it is already recognized as a national model of transit-oriented development. Neighborhoods such as what has taken place in Arlington, for example. It works specifically in this case because the people participated, the elected officials made that decision of inclusionary participation, and now it's occurred and it's really, really working. If we could use that formula across the country for the next 50 years, look at the reduction in carbon emissions we'd have, look at the reduction in sprawl, look at the reduction in energy uh, demand that we'd have. So they really would have people that would walk, live, work, and play in their own neighborhoods. I mean, that's, that's really what we were looking for from the standpoint of planning. It was a real uh, commitment to planning and a belief in the future um, that we're benefiting from decades later. For us now is the challenge to be good stewards and to do today not only maintain what we have, but also be thinking about 15, 20 years, maybe more down the line, and how uh, we are going to give the next generation the same quality of life, if not better, than what we are enjoying today. The political leadership was clearly willing to go the distance to, to pay for it, to make it happen and to pay for it. Perhaps it's been successful because um, the citizens are active and um, really believe in the community and they want to stay here. They're very gratifying, not so much at a personal level, 
um, but at, 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 the, at a community level, if you will, um, to see that it worked, to see that, um, that uh, in, in many ways it has turned out better than people could have envisioned. You try to do the best you can, and when it turns out well, you're very proud of it. And uh, I, I'm very proud of Arlington County. I think we've I think we've done a good job uh, as a as a community. I love Arlington County, and uh, uh, I, I would never live anywhere. In fact, uh, I want my ashes blown over some park in Arlington. I like it so much. I don't want to leave. All of this transformation wouldn't have taken place without good leaders on the county board. But you can't lead unless you've got followers. So I think it took both. And, um, you know, in a sense, I think we ought to be very grateful that we've had this. Mm -hmm.